I mean, that's the key piece of it is that it's like a secret handshake. <laughs> it's like, you know, right off the bat, if somebody can pronounce your company name right, then they're in your target market. We have this data science team, which I mean, data science as a, as a professional class has come so far uh, in the past 10 years. It was really a unique thing uh, in 20, 2010, 2011 to have a robust data science team. Decided to go the M&A route, uh, spent a year putting the team and the technology into the fight, you know, train all of the sellers on the acquired products. And it was an amazing experience. Austin. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I, I, I'm thrilled to be able to reconnect with you here uh, in front of this audience. I've known you for a really long time. Um, so we were actually introduced. It took a while to, to figure this out, but it seems like 2013, 2014, Sam Hecht, who uh, worked at Meta Markets at the time, um, which was an ad tech company, and I was in the ad tech space, we met, and I think he literally said something to me like, I've got a friend, Austin, who's really interesting that you should meet. <laughs> it sounds about right. It definitely was, was that far back, for sure. And I'm very glad that you and Sam are both out of the ad tech game. Well, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I like where I am now and with what I'm doing. I'm not gonna just badmouth the ad tech space on air unilaterally. Um, but yeah, I think that there are interesting problems that can be solved in other spaces too. <laughs> oh. um, so, uh, and then more recently, we were reintroduced by Drew Conway, who was on episode number 511. Yep. And that was the first episode um, that I ever did live in front of an audience, which was really exciting. Yeah. Um, that was a good one. Yeah. And Drew's been a, a mutual friend of both of ours for probably just as long back to 2013. At least, right? I've never met Drew in person. No way. No, I, I, I met him. I was introduced to him uh, with the purpose of having him on the podcast. Amazing. And he's, so, I've, yeah, that's such a cool connection now. It really is because he's somebody. You know, his book, uh, Machine Learning for Hackers, that was a key book for me, transitioning from academia into professional data science. Yeah, me too. It was that one and Matthew Russell's Mining the Social Web which was like a Python book, very similarly spirited to uh, Drew's and John Miles White, right? Yeah, John Miles White was the other author on there. Yeah, yeah. so when we met, I was running uh, my prior startup called Y Hat, and uh, it was a data science platform. And I'm sure that Sam put us in touch because we were both nerding out about the same stuff at the same time. I was also potentially a client. Probably yeah. that was an angle, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so the company name is something that I'd like to talk about first. So why <laughs> hat, uh, brilliant name. Um, so many listeners, uh, people who are familiar with machine learning statistics will already be aware of this, but we typically use the variable Y to represent the outcome, uh, that we're trying to predict with a model. And, uh, when it has the little hat on top, <laughs> uh, circumflex, uh, it's this like two-sided triangle <laughs> that is on the top of a Y. And it's the actual prediction that a machine learning model makes in a given circumstance. And so absolutely brilliant name for a data science company. Uh, I wish I thought of it first. It was a really fun name, but the, the, the list of pronunciations that we would get from <laughs> outsiders, non-data nerds, right, was exactly. hilarious. A lot of like, is it, is it pronounced <laughs> yacht or what is this? I always uh, assured people that our customers understood. That's, I mean, that's the key piece of it is that it's like a secret handshake. <laughs> it's like, you know, right off the bat, if somebody can pronounce your company name right, then they're in your target market. That's right. If they can't, then it's probably a waste of your time. You can end the call. Yep. In <laughs> fact, we trained all of our salespeople. That was the qualification standard. <laughs> <laughs> You're not, it, actually? No. No. Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah you had this big juicy contract size, but you couldn't pronounce our name right, so we're cutting it. Um, so yeah, so amazing company name, but that's not all, also an amazing company. <laughs> um, so there were, at that time, almost, not almost any query, but I could write a lot of questions into my Google search related to data science, mm -hmm. and very frequently, the answer that would come up was a Y Hat blog post. So you guys did a ton of uh, sharing with the community of 
you know, Python tricks, R tricks, stats tricks, machine learning tricks, if you'd publish them and write them in a really compelling way, you must have had a lot of, uh, a lot of your blog posts that must have been high up on Hacker News, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, totally. So Greg, my co-founder and I, he and I were both uh, product managers uh, before we founded YHAT at a company called On Deck Capital. And it, we started there, I started in 2010, Greg joined about a year later, and it was a very interesting time for the open source statistical programming community. There was a, a big tailwind behind R and Python. Lots of organizations had been recently transitioning off of um, paid languages like MATLAB or SAS. And the open source tools that were available were really coming into an a, a entirely new level. Like yep. Pandas, was, Pandas was probably first released in earlier, 2007, 2008, I would imagine. But by 2010, it was really quite a robust platform. And um, in any case, long story short, Greg and I were, were big users of these tools. Um, Scikit-learn, Greg had been using very early in that project's life. Pandas, the various R packages, um, the tidy universe, et cetera. And, um, we were just really interested to, to share real world examples in a sea of, um, you know, very toy demos that we thought were out there. A lot of like iris data sets and so forth. And we were really interested to, um, share what we were doing first at work uh, at On Deck before we started YHAT. Uh-huh. We got into this uh, blogging on our own personal blogs first, and then when we decided to start the company, it was just very natural for us to, to migrate all the content there and to continue that, that tradition. Yeah, and it, it, it definitely worked. It paid off, you know, I, I'm sure you were just doing it out of interest, like to, to engage people with this content. But in terms of a brand strategy, it, it just coincidentally worked out incredibly because you developed this, um, this cachet as leaders to look to um, for any of these kinds of questions. I knew that if one of the top results for a data science question that I had was a Y hat article, it was going to be well written, it was going to be clear. Um, and so yeah, so I'm sure that that was great for uh, hiring and, uh, and for getting business and anything like that. It, it was really fun to build and definitely very influential. At, at peak, I think we, were, we had like 100,000 or so unique visitors a month, which wow. is nothing yeah. to sneeze at. They're, they're just, you know, for sure. the data science community is growing, fast growing, but it isn't that big, so. Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, if you, if you have a general website for anybody that has a million visitors a month, that's huge. Mm. And so to have 100,000 when only one percent or fewer. It's, it's, it's got to be way less than one percent of people are data scientists mm-hmm. or like people who are looking up coding problems online. So um, that's kind of like the equivalent of having a ten million view website um, uh, when you adjust for yeah the market size. So super cool. Um, and the products that you were building were really practical as well for data scientists. So I remember I think maybe the first call that we ever had back in two thousand thirteen or two thousand fourteen was you giving me a demo of the Rodeo Python Mm -hmm. IDE, the Integrated Development Environment for making, uh, to get, uh, so the idea of an IDE, like RStudio, people might be familiar with, um, is to bring lots of different kinds of functionality that could be in different panels all together into one view, so you can see your variables, you can see the code you're executing, you can see your outputs, you can see all your file names, and so I guess actually maybe that's a little bit of an analogy. It's kind of like an R Studio for Python. That was our whole objective. Oh. <laughs> we, we were obsessed with R Studio. Right. Like huge R Studio fans. And at the time there was no support for Python that was remotely close to that experience. So we built Rodeo as like a pixel for pixel, you know, sort of clone of R Studio. We obviously didn't get nearly as far uh, into that project as our studio has, you know, spent many decades at this point working on. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was the goal. And uh, you know, there are other solutions that have come about that are way better now. You know, VS Code has a lot of support for Python and data science specifically. Um, but yeah, at the time, that was a it's a really really fun project that had a lot of early legs. Yeah. 
Um, and so it attracted the attention of not only data scientists as users, but these cool tools that you were building um, attracted amazing investment. So you guys were in the Y Combinator program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we founded the company in 2013 in New York, and um, we did a $1 million seed round. And I, we were living in, we were roommates, working out of our apartment um, for the first year or so, until we got to be a team of seven. And then we finally got a kind of uh, basic office. You were in the apartment up to team yeah, of seven. It was really inappropriate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just in Carroll Gardens on Court Street, everyone would show up in the morning, and there we were. <laughs> um, Making we, a cup of coffee. Yeah, we grew out of that eventually. But um, yeah, uh, so Greg and I have been working at On Deck, which is an alternative lending company, sort of like Lending Club, but for small businesses. And we were both product managers, um, so our charge was to to build stuff that you know customers would use. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the uh, underlying functionality that we were, uh, that the, the web apps we were building needed was advanced uh, risk models and dynamic uh, prices, risk-based pricing, credit scores, this type of stuff. And it was very, very painful process by which a data science team would express whatever model or imputation strategy they wanted to, um, to deploy into production. And that was the impetus uh, that precipitated our leaving to go start Y Hat. It was like, how do we take this very expensive and complex and valuable data science work and transform it from something simply academic that uh, is, is on a, a laptop into you know, an iPhone experience or a web app uh, experience? And now there are some wonderful tools for this, but at the time, our strategy was very bad. We would just rewrite the code into, we were using a lot of Java, a lot of Ruby, and you know, little details like R has a different uh, floating point decimal precision than does Java. These little right. details or zero are very consequential. Or one indexing. Exactly. Right, confusion, yeah. Who, what, what kind of a sick person <laughs> indexes at one? My God. Yeah, I know, but somehow the entire R language. The whole thing. I know. Um, statisticians, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Eliminating unnecessary distractions is one of the central principles of my lifestyle. As such, I only subscribe to a handful of email newsletters, those that provide a massive signal to noise ratio. One of the very few that meet my strict criterion is the Data Science Insider. If you weren't aware of it already, the Data Science Insider is a 100% free newsletter that the Super Data Science team creates and sends out every Friday. We pour over all of the news and identify the most important breakthroughs in the fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. The top five, simply five news items. The top five items are handpicked, the items that we're confident will be most relevant to your personal and professional growth. Each of the five articles is summarized into a standardized, easy to read format, and then packed gently into a single email. This means that you don't have to go and read the whole article. You can read our summary and be up to speed on the latest and greatest data innovations in no time at all. That said, if any items do particularly tickle your fancy, then you can click through and read the full article. This is what I do. I skim the Data Science Insider newsletter every week, those items that are relevant to me, I read the summary in full. And if that signals to me that I should be digging into the full original piece, for example, to pour over figures, equations, code, or experimental methodology, I click through and dig deep. So, if you'd like to get the best signal-to-noise ratio out there in data science, machine learning, and AI news, subscribe to the Data Science Insider, which is completely free and no strings attached, at superdatascience.com DSI. That's superdatascience.com slash D-S-I. And now, let's return to our amazing episode. Um, so, yeah, so you're kind of, uh, yeah, so you're describing like the, the tools you were building at Y Hat 
were solving this kind of problem. Yeah, so what we wanted to do was to basically the, <laughs> the moment doing, doing minus one yeah. on a bunch of on a bunch of language <laughs> translations. Precisely. <laughs> uh, no, like we had this data science team, which I mean, data science as a, as a professional class has come so far uh, in the past 10 years. Like it was really uh, a unique thing uh, in 20, 2010, 2011 to have a robust data science team. Sure. We felt very fortunate to have that and to be able to work with, you know, PhDs that know all about support vector regression. Like this was very novel stuff. And uh, it was extremely frustrating to know what it was possible to achieve with respect to opening the, the, the book of, um, of loans to a wider audience. We wanted to reach more customers and it took months and months to get certain models into production. So that was super frustrating as product people. We wanted to deliver these experiences that we knew were possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, you know, it's very reasonable for a software engineer a product designer to not know all of the intricacies of machine learning models. And you know, from, a, from an outsider's perspective, if software engineer and a data scientist are both writing code all day, but these are quite different fields and you know, operations that come cheap and easy in R or Python may not be nearly as accessible exactly. in another target language. So yeah. that, that was what our flagship uh, product at Y Hat was. It was a, you, you import the Python or R library right. and uh, deploy any arbitrary expression as a very low latency uh, API, very robust API, right. that then any developer in the world is going to be able to use. Right, 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 right. Yeah, super cool. And so, yeah, so even early on, attracted, uh, you know, you were in the most famous accelerator on the planet, Y Combinator. Um, so... Probably a lot of listeners have, have heard of Y Combinator. So this is a, it's a program um, based out of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. that takes in, I don't know how many now, what, what's in a class, in a Y Combinator class, dozens of companies? Oh, it's, it's quite big now. So yeah. they do two batches per year. Our, ours, we did it in 2015, uh, several years after we'd started Y Hat, actually. And um, I think there was like 115 companies in our batch. That sounds big, but I'm guessing the, the, the most now are... they're even bigger now. Yeah. It's crazy, uh, but yeah, it, it was an incredible experience. Yeah, I mean, Y Combinator is a very interesting model. They accept uh, a certain number of, of of companies into each batch, and you spend three months out in Silicon Valley. Although uh, during the pandemic, they've now transitioned this to Zoom, oh, and. Man. Um, it's just a laser focused period of 90 days where you're working very oh, hard. It's just 90 days. Yeah. And um, we, at the end, we brought the whole team from New York. We brought everybody out for the last couple of weeks, which is really fun. Cool. And so, yeah, so they, they give you a little bit of funding, but it's mostly about the mentorship and the network. Yeah. So I, they give you 100,000 or so um, in investment. And which is not, it's not that much, but it's all about the, the network and they provide you with very, very uh, accomplished entrepreneurs who yeah. sort of guide you through, you know, based upon where your company is. Some are, are quite early stage. We were probably at, I don't know, 30 or 40,000 in, in annual revenue. So we were among the earlier stage companies that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they really help you focus on what your particulars are that your business is going to need in order to take it to the next level. Yeah, in order to grow rapidly, uh, in order to blitz scale, probably in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases, uh, yeah. How are you gonna find network effects? Mm -hmm. um, making sure that you have product market fit. Yep. Um, and then, you also, you probably meet, if there's even back then with a hundred other companies, you find other companies that you can work with. Um, uh, you know, you're solving different parts of the same puzzle, perhaps, or you can be a vendor to them or vice versa. I think mm -hmm. a lot of that happens in these places, right? Yeah, yeah. totally. They encourage, uh, you know, barters, essentially, among portfolio companies. But more than anything, you're totally right. You, you find that most problems in business or technology are not unique. Every company has some unique problems that they need to solve, uh, technical or otherwise. But for the most part, people have encountered all kinds of patterns. And when you're in 
uh, program like Y Combinator, it's very useful to learn from the, the Y Combinator partners themselves, but also the other founders that you're in the room with are overwhelmingly uh, helpful and and guiding you through you know various things that they've encountered that mirror a lot of your challenges. Cool. Yeah, so that worked out for you guys. Um, you definitely accelerated out of the <laughs> accelerator. We did, fortunately. Um, and then, yeah, so over the years, I mean, I guess I'm kind of skipping. <laughs> I don't know if there's interesting stories that you want to tell along the way that would be uh, interesting for our listeners from Y Combinator to acquisition, but ultimately you were acquired by a big listed data company, Alteryx. Mm -hmm. uh, so congratulations, that's amazing. And uh, that was back in 2018. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if you want to talk about if there's anything in particular in between there <laughs> that like part of the journey that was exciting. Oh, there's, it was quite the saga. I mean, in the very beginning, Greg and I had envisioned Y Hat as being a, primarily a Heroku for predictive models product where we imagined the data scientists would come sign up put their credit card in and be able to deploy you know, their models to our cloud, essentially. We quickly found that that business model wasn't going to work for our customer base, that overwhelmingly uh, companies that had invested in data science teams, teams considered the byproducts of, of that investment to be cr like critical uh, intellectual property. Right. They just weren't comfortable deploying to our cloud. And also, just like every other startup, the, the perceived or actual immaturity of the organization is viewed as a risk, especially for infrastructure and right, you know, right, products right, like right. ours. Yeah. So you know, that was probably the first year we struggled to make even a few shekels. Right, and yeah. um, You're like, guys, we've got this super reliable, we, got, we can totally do this. They're like, how long have you been doing it for? And what are your clients? They're like, eh. You got it. <laughs> uh, and then we, we literally took the advice of one of our investors had been telling us every couple of months, you need to 10x your price and take down the, the you know, SaaS model and go straight enterprise. And that was very good advice that we didn't listen to early <laughs> enough, I would say. Um, That's a good tip. But the moment that we changed to a uh, annual contract model, uh, we did need to change the product uh, to be able to deploy in any one in any of the cloud environments that our customers were using, which was you know new technical territory for uh, all of us at the time. We'd never built anything that was meant to run across you know various versions of Red Hat and CentOS and. Um, but yeah, it was quite, quite the, the saga. Nice. And yeah, um, a happy ending. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't get better than that to be, uh, your first company that you founded. And then five years later, you get acquired by a reputed company, big listed company, data company in the space. So that's huge. And one of the things that I think is uh, interesting about your story in particular, is that you were a, a hands-on founder. So you were technical. Um, and I, I, I knew that from our very first meeting where you were showing me, you know, you were running Python code, R code uh, in front of me to demonstrate how your products worked. And for me, I think that that's really cool. I think that for me personally, I have a strong preference for working with CEOs like you who are technical founders. Um, I think that technical founders like that have a much more realistic understanding of the challenges that people face as they develop software products or, in your case, data science products wrapped into software in particular. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, obviously, there are limits. Like, Not everybody needs to be uh, PhD level familiar with every technical topic in order to start a business. But I think in it, it, certainly in software land, it, it really does help in the early phase to appreciate what's on the menu for you know possibilities when it comes to building something. Um, it just helps you set realistic expectations with yourself and with you know customers, outside stakeholders, your investors, etc. Um, a lot faster and a lot more accurately. That's definitely true. Um, that being said, I appreciate the, the 
<laughs> the the compliment, though I would much I would self describe more as a hacker than anything else. I I studied Arabic and Spanish as an undergraduate, <laughs> very much a self taught programmer, and you know. A lot of this community, super data science, what you uh, put up on YouTube, your Udemy courses, this type of stuff, Drew's book, Matthew Russell's book, uh, I, I attribute all of my technical development to that ethos. And um, it is amazing what one can teach oneself with respect to this whole ecosystem. Yeah, so tell us about that. That was a question I had for you for later, but it just came up organically, so we yeah. might as well get, get into it. So okay. how did you go yeah. from doing an Arabic and Spanish degree <laughs> to somebody who's hacking together uh, data science solutions, founding a software company? I guess we have a little piece of the puzzle there that there was this intermediate part where you were a product manager, mm -hmm. but um, how, did, how did you even know that? How did you know that you wanted to go from Arabic and Spanish to product management, and where <laughs> in that journey did you start picking up uh, using YouTube videos and Udemy for, for teaching yourself code? Yeah, well, definitely roundabout uh, way to find my way into tech. Um, I was certain I was I was going to work as a spy for a brief moment really? as an undergraduate. <laughs> I guess that explains um, a major. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. just like, very interested in travel, very interested in politics and uh, political theory as an undergraduate, and. Um, I got into tech as a result of an internship that I, was, I did between two, two years of um, my undergraduate. Um, I worked for a very small at the time startup in DC, just the three founders in a house on uh, M Street. And the company's called Everfi, it's still around, quite big now. And I, I just caught the entrepreneurial bug. I, I didn't know that this was a, a profession, that right. it, it was possible to start companies. And, um, that experience led me to seek uh, others like it, um, which is how I found my first job out of college at On Deck, the, the tech-enabled lending company that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And you just spend a few hours with a, a group of engineers building something, and if you, at least for me, I, I found the whole thing to be very interesting and. Yeah. It was frustrating not to, to, to know how it all works. Right, right, right. Um, so that's how I got into it. And the, the resources, fortunately, were there. You know, it's quite, um, we're very privileged to live in the time uh, that we do if you're interested to learn about design, about product building, about engineering, about yeah. data science. Almost anything. Almost anything. It's, you know, it's an unparalleled time in history, I find, you know, sometimes I'm out at a cocktail party or whatever, and those haven't really been happening much in the pandemic, but like, <laughs> I, you know, I end up in these situations where people will say things like, oh, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's something we need at a time like this. It's never been this bad. Like, it's a good thing that at least this one person is doing something good and with the way that everything's horrible in the world. And it seems so crazy to me because if you look at the data, in almost any respect over the last few decades, certainly over the last few centuries, um, in terms of literacy, in terms of democracy, in terms of lifespan, in terms of quality of life over a long lifespan, in terms of just being able to put food on the table, uh, more and more people on our planet, uh, a, greater, great, a greater and greater proportion of people on our planet are able to eat every day <laughs> and to live a long, healthy life, and um, so on. You know, even in that in that one respect, things are getting better all the time. And as a specific kind of, you know, on a smaller scale, you know, it's not as big as being literate or staying alive, having food to eat, but access to information. There's, I mean, I guess there's a, there's a flip side where there's so much information that I think a lot of people get. <laughs> caught up in garbage information. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Uh, as we experience in American politics. There's such a thing basis. as too much. Yeah, and so yeah, there's so much information that you can just end up uh, in a whole other world, and a whole other reality, which is a problem. But <laughs> there are still a lot of resources, that, in terms of learning resources for teaching yourself basically anything, but in particular, um, data science stuff, 
Um, like totally. Yeah. I, I'm very bullish on uh, professional education platforms, Udemy, Coursera. Um, some of the most talented engineers that I've ever worked with have come out of boot camps, uh, Flatiron School and um, Rutgers Center and so forth. Very, it, it, it's a, it's a um, I, I don't think it's always obvious to someone who doesn't come from a formal engineering education uh, to understand that it is, it, it is accessible to, to uh, jump into tech and to learn these skills. And insofar as your technical career takes you down a road where you need a, a master's or a PhD, that is available down the road too. Totally. Uh, but yeah, couldn't, do it I online. couldn't recommend more just if you're interested to learn to code, sink your teeth in early, um, don't be intimidated by it. Yeah, totally. It's like, uh, yeah, if you're listening and you're in the kind of situation that Austin was uh, just prior to Y Hat, where you're around engineers or data scientists and you're looking at their screens and you're like, oh, that looks so complicated, I could never do it. Literally, you can. You definitely <laughs> can. Anybody can do it. Um, yeah. You just you just need to start somewhere, and uh, yeah, and you could ask that very engineer or data scientist what they recommend for that particular problem. Totally. Yeah. yeah. What blog post should I check out? What uh, book should I check out? What online curriculum should I check out? And you'll be on your way. Um, yeah. So very cool. Um, so after the acquisition of Y Hat by Alteryx. As is common when these acquisitions happen, uh, a lot of the team, and uh, often particularly the leadership team, stay on uh, at the acquiring company. And so you stayed at Alteryx for a year. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's anything interesting in particular yeah. you'd like to share about that, yeah. So uh, all, we hadn't planned, it was on our objective to sell the company. It, we'd been at it for four and a half years or so. And in 2017, there were a number of Alteryx uh, data scientists that had signed up for free trials. And this, uh, they were all working on a, on a hackathon internally. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten some airtime with uh, them and had a blast. And one of them socialized that they were working on their hackathon project uh, using some of our technology. And it made its way up the, up the food chain. Oh, and funny. so Alteryx is a very interesting company. They predominantly... Their flagship product is a desktop app, uh, drag and drop sort of data manipulation. There's some machine learning tools that are in there, but imagine if Pandas had a UI, uh, it, what would that a look click like? A click and point UI, yeah. And uh, It's a no code or low code tool, right? It, exactly, yeah. and very, very popular, uh, very large uh, user base. Yeah. And they had been studying the, the data science landscape, uh, which was emerging uh, you know, in the years preceding. And basically, they had come to the conclusion that while they have this amazing uh, desktop app that serves for uh, many use cases, one class of data professional, that there is this emerging class of, uh, of other data professionals that uh, don't work exclusively with drag and drop tools or with uh, tools with UIs. And that there was this whole class that was uh, underserved by enterprise software to support the open source uh, tools like Pandas and in Python and, and various R ecosystem tools. And they were actively looking for a way to, to advance their product roadmap uh, to serve that population, which is why they, you know, they looked at us. They probably looked at, uh, at the time, there was a company called Sense. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um founded around the same time. Uh, Dataku was founded around then. Same with um, uh, Domino. Oh yeah, yeah. Sort of data robot. I, it was a bit of a different kind of thing, but these data science platforms were very attractive uh, targets for Alteryx to add quickly, add tools that would support uh, different use cases that they needed to support for this particular um, code-friendly uh, type type solutions. Nice. Um, <laughs> that's a really good explanation yeah. and. You know, how, what was that like? What was that like to have your small knit team, many of <laughs> you having uh, uh, grown up in the same apartment, <laughs> working on top of each other? Yeah. 
uh, you know, you probably would have been involved with hiring almost everybody at Y Hat. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're part of a much larger organization. Um, was that easy? It was an exciting uh, journey and uh, a challenging one, obviously. So we, we were 17 people at, at the time of the acquisition, so we weren't a very big team. Yeah, so Altrix was actively looking to add to their portfolio of products tools that would serve data scientists that are working with code instead of just the drag and drop audience. And we were an attractive target. They loved our, our roadmap and what we'd been planning to build. Um, they, it was precisely what they were looking to bring into their own uh, product stack. And yeah, we decided to go the M&A route, uh, spent a year putting the team and the technology into the fight, you know, train all of the sellers on the acquired products. And it was an amazing experience. You know, I, I couldn't have used all of the venture capital dollars that we had raised uh, previously as an independent company to, to buy my way into some of these uh, sales right. opportunities, you know, yeah. doing a million dollar deal with Nike uh, to, to uh, equip them with our software was an incredible, incredible experience. Cool. Um, and then after a year at Alteryx, you did something that sounds really nice to me as somebody who I don't think I've had a vacation in nine years. So you took some very well-deserved time off to travel. Yeah, so after I stayed for a year, I took six, six or nine months uh, off, traveled all around, um, went to Uzbekistan, and Ukraine, and Lake Como, and Nashville, and uh, yeah. Nashville? Nashville. What a weird place to pick. Oh, wow. <laughs> Big bluegrass fan. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, uh, yeah, so how did you, I mean, you just, you picked places like, you went to Chernobyl in Ukraine, right? I did, yes. Yeah, yeah that was uh, a dark, a dark day. Um, yeah, I just picked places that were, uh, that have always been interesting to me. In particular, Uzbekistan was, has always been a, uh, like a bucket list trip. Yeah, it's not a country you hear a lot about. No, it's not. <laughs> But I'm very interested in Central Asia. Yeah. Very interested in you know the Mongols and history. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, and then after taking that time, or maybe even during that time traveling, getting some headspace, started to percolate, I guess, on the next thing, which emerged in 2019. You founded Leica. You're founder and CEO of Leica now, and it's going pretty well. So you just raised a $35 million Series B led by JP Morgan Growth Equity Partners, bringing the total amount raised to $48 million. I know you're doing something in compliance. Yeah. So tell us more about that. Well, how did you like stumble upon this opportunity? What are you guys doing? Yeah. So uh, definitely, e even while I was at Alltricks, I, I knew that I uh, intended to build something else early stage. And it was a matter of figuring out what I want to work on. And one of the problems that we encountered uh, both before the M&A uh, when I was running Y Hat, as well as after the M&A uh, as part of the, the, the bigger company, uh, in going to market with a B2B software application, especially with an enterprise sale, do you encounter a lot of uh, security due diligence and compliance scrutiny that for many uh, early stage companies and even late stage or publicly traded uh, sales teams is very, very challenging. Um, there's rigorous uh, expectations that buyers have with respect to their software providers. And Leica is designed uh, to, to solve that problem. So we are a compliance automation platform. You basically hook Leica up to all of the services you use to run your business your cloud provider, your ticketing system, um, your code repositories, et cetera. And Leica will aggregate automatically all of the things that are relevant to proving your compliance posture uh, cool. for the purposes of sales or uh, in many cases, regulatory uh, uh, reasons as well. Yeah, uh, I can see the huge value in this. There's a huge opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I can see Austin, there is this huge problem. If you're a gigantic company like Microsoft, you can afford to have a dedicated team to handle these gigantic compliant requests that come through when, uh, when somebody's considering working with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have an individual 
compliance request for an individual potential um, client could have 100 or 200 questions. Some of these questions are easy to answer, maybe take the person only a few minutes, but other ones take hours to answer. And you need, you need to talk to lots of technical experts to dig down and like figure out, do we have you know, scenario A or scenario B? Or um, So yeah, so if you have a small company, uh, which I reckon is, is your target market primarily, if you're a smaller company, then you, you don't have this army of people that, that can deal with these kinds of requests. Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. The, like, the average software company is not going to be uh, familiar with the breadth of uh, security and compliance requirements and expectations across every geography, every industry. You know, what is expected from a buyer at Yale New Haven is quite different from uh, an Australian bank, which is quite different still from a California-based software company. And how is it possible for the average SaaS business to stay abreast of all of these requirements? And to add insult to injury, it is overwhelmingly the case that the person most likely to be asked questions about encryption standards and information security policies is a salesperson who's the least likely to know about these concepts. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of friction and a lot of challenge uh, bound up with the, these due diligence processes, these procurement processes. Yeah, and so in terms of the ROI, the return on investment of working with a company like Leica, is that it means that more deals can go through, right? Totally. The, that's what excites me so, so much about this. Uh, I, it, it's not obvious to uh, most entrepreneurs, it certainly was not obvious to me in, when I was running Y Hat, that there is a relationship between compliance and top line revenue. Totally. Um, you know, the, of course, compliance is a, is a protect the bottom line function that's quite obvious. Everybody paying attention can, can notice that. But there really is a growth lever to be found in building a robust compliance uh, program within your organization. It helps expedite deals. It helps build trust with uh, partners and customers. It helps you enter new markets uh, faster. Um, and so in that sense, it is a, a, a growth machine. Yeah, and that's, I think that's even, uh, I hadn't actually pieced that together in your, in your signature, so maybe it's your slogan for the company. It's, it's like the, the founder's unexpected growth lever or something like that, right? The growth lever most founders overlook. Right, that's, that's the right. one, yeah. And yeah, that's a really good point. It's like there's this opportunity by working with a company like yours to smooth out um, compliance requests. You can get through them more quickly. You can assure prospective clients um, uh, more wholeheartedly, more convincingly, mm -hmm. um, and more deals will go through that otherwise might have slipped through the cracks. Yeah, it's also a good idea. You know, uh, the tech industry overall has some maturing to do when it comes to not playing fast and loose with the rules. Um, Obviously, I'm an entrepreneur, so there's a balance between doing things uh, sluggishly and slow and, and, and doing things recklessly. Um, and we help our customers find that right balance in a stage appropriate way, right. help them grow in a mature way, um, and it, it doesn't overcomplicate or break the bank either. Right. In a way, it actually it kind of it can allow uh, the leadership at a smaller software company to feel more comfortable with being reckless because you know that you're within the bounds of the constraints that a company like Leica is providing. Exactly, that's the peace of mind that uh, I would have wanted at Y Hat and uh, that hopefully we provide to our customers as well. Cool, so given all of the data science work that you were doing in the past with Y Hat and then later Alteryx, um, I suspect that there's probably a data science angle here with Leica as well. Yeah, there definitely is. So um, a, lot, a lot of the data that we're ingesting uh, from our customers' day-to-day -day operations is, represents a very unique and novel uh, data artifact. Nobody has uh, previously compiled all of this compliance-relevant data in the way in which we have. And there are lots of interesting things we can do with this one of the things that we're doing that's really cool uh, is processing arbitrary text uh, questions that appear as part of an RFP or as part of a 
uh, security compliance review and giving our customers the ability to automatically respond accurately with verifiable compliance data pertinent cool. to those questions. So if you're a salesperson and you encounter a question about hypervisor security or encryption standards, you may not know about these things. And if you have Leica, it doesn't matter uh, because Leica provides you a UI that automatically will answer such questions in a way that's verifiable. Nice. Yeah, that sounds like a complicated but also very cool and very powerful natural language processing technique falling into the question and answering realm of the NLP field. Indeed. Yeah, Indeed. It's going to be cool. To, uh, yeah. And yeah, hugely useful. Um, so, you know, you love talking about data science. You've done a lot of data science hands on in the past. As a hacker, mm. you still hacking away at Leica? Always. Always. <laughs> all, they don't let me. Uh, push code to production anymore. Yeah, nobody but, lets me uh, do that either. No, always. I'm always interested to uh, to check out the latest and greatest. Um, Python is core part of my day to day. Always find a reason to script something out, you know? Nice. Um, yeah, do you have any particular tools that you use that uh, listeners might not be aware of that you recommend? Um, so I like... Um, so I love Snow Snowflake is the best database that I've ever used. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. It's, yeah. it's just a wonderful tool. Um, and the, there's a, a desktop IDE called Popsicle, Pop SQL. It's a very cute name. Oh. Uh, that's probably my newest data-related tool that I that I'm using. Very cool. Uh, I don't think we've had at least since I've been host of the show for the last year. Mm -hmm. Those are two uh, tools that has never that have never hmm. come up before. So those are cool. So I guess in the Popsicle IDE, that's specifically for working with kind of structured querying languages. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a SQL IDE that's designed for analysis. So you know you're not given you're not given a UI to explore the table schema as much as you are given a UI that lets you plot things quickly and oh, cool. sensible default plots, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've never seen that before. I've never seen a a querying yeah. tool. Like, yeah, that's the kind of thing we've come to expect, just like our studio before you created Rodeo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so for R or Python, respectively, this is the same kind of thing for SQL. Indeed, yeah. same thing. And it's actually, it's amazing that I haven't even thought to look for something like that before. It would have to exist, and I'm glad it does, because uh, the only language in data science that's more popular than R or Python SQL. is SQL. Yeah. Cool. Great to know about that. And I'm sure our listeners appreciate it too. Now, you've talked about uh, learning about data science, coding, uh, through online tools. And I know mm -hmm. from a conversation that we were having just before we started recording that you're really big right now into learning about uh, games. <laughs> so like the Unity gaming environment. Tell us about Unity and, and why you got into these things. I just like games a lot. <laughs> Board games, video games, yeah. and uh, just like the, the data science community has made available unbelievable resources to learn all kinds of things about different, different flavors of data science, same has happened in the evolution of game design. Um, so the one I've been learning the most is uh, Unity. There are other... Um, uh, game engines out there that are equally accessible, but yeah, I've been having a lot of fun with it. Unity is a famous game engine for deep reinforcement learning problems. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Tell me. So, deep reinforcement learning, um, uh, as you're probably aware, and maybe many listeners are aware, is um, it's an it's an absolutely fascinating area mm -hmm. of data science. It's the closest thing we have to um, an artificial intelligence system today that can make a complex sequence of decisions in a kind of real world environment. So we use deep reinforcement learning algorithms, for example, to play board games, but they're also adept at exploring environments and playing kind of like, you know, shooter games. Like, I don't know, I grew up playing like Goldeneye, <laughs> but like that kind of game. And so there are uh, tools online, and in fact, in my textbook, Deep Learning Illustrated, in chapter 13, which is on deep reinforcement learning, um, I talk about the kind of main options available for you to deploy your deep reinforcement mm -hmm. learning algorithm into. 
So there are, um, there are environments, open source environments, that allow you to play relatively simple games or two-dimensional games like Atari video games. Once you get into the 3D realm, the Unity game engine mm. is used uh, it, disproportionately. It's the, it's the standard for creating uh, 3D environments for deep reinforcement learning algorithms to, to play with. And so things like gravity, things like grasping in three dimensions, um, yeah, all this kind of stuff that you need to do in 3D, the, the, the Unity game engine um, facilitates that. And a really interesting byproduct of that is that it allows you to go from uh, having, so you can train a deep reinforcement learning algorithm how to behave in a simulated gaming environment mm. provided by Unity, but then that can translate to real world capacity to navigate an environment or uh, to, to solve a Rubik's Cube, to, to grasp an object. Mm. Um, so anyway, fascinating. Yeah. So do you write, or is it like a unity out of the box set of reinforcement learning tools that are there? I'll have to check it out. Yeah, exactly. So I haven't done it myself. Mm. Um, it sounds like together we could probably, it sounds like we have a weekend <laughs> project here. Yeah, exactly. There's like, Perfect. if you can provide the kind of the understanding yeah. of unity, um, a, a really good for listeners as well as potentially you, um, uh, two friends of mine, Laura Gracer and mm -hmm. Walloon Kang, they wrote a book published by Addison Wesley um, called um, something like Hands-On Deep Reinforcement mm -hmm. Learning um, or if Fundamentals of Deep Reinforcement Learning. I should remember it better and we'll get it right in the show notes um, because it's a book that I was I reviewed. I was an editor for the, the deep learning uh, components of it. Um, oh, and that's a critical thing is that the thing that makes deep reinforcement learning, the reason why it has that name, the reinforcement learning part is related to a kind of problem that you can solve. And um, reinforcement learning problems are characterized by the actions that you take impact the data you get back. Mm. So this is different in, in data science uh, or in machine learning. We more commonly we have supervised or unsupervised learning problems. And in either of those cases, your data set doesn't change based on model outputs. But with the reinforcement learning paradigm, if you're thinking about playing a video game or playing a board game, every action that the, every output that the algorithm has changes the environment and the, the response of the opponent or uh, you know, the way that the 3D environment looks. Mm -hmm. um, so reinforcement learning has to deal with this, con this continuous change and to make uh, decisions despite the continuously changing environment. Um, and in recent years, deep learning, so the use of artificial neural networks to uh, solve these reinforcement learning problems has really taken off. Mm. And so we call that area deep reinforcement learning. And anyway, this, this book uh, by Gracer, uh, Laura Gracer and Kang Walloon is brilliant as an introduction to the field of deep reinforcement mm. learning. And I know they specifically built um, an open source tool that makes it very easy to integrate with uh, Unity games and create deep reinforcement learning agents, or in fact, actually use their pre-built deep reinforcement learning agents. So you can just, just like in scikit-learn, yep. where you say, all right, I want a random forest, or I want a regression model, you can say, I want a deep reinforcement learning agent, um, and you can read their book to see what kinds of types might be useful for a particular game, and then just use their pre-coded um, deep reinforcement learning agent that they put together in PyTorch and apply that to whatever uh, Unity uh, game that you'd like to. That's very cool. Anyway, so your show, and I just did a lot of talking, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Um, hopefully interesting. Um, so nice, yeah, so that's cool. Um, so yeah, you've, you know, over the years, uh, I don't know if you'd ever say, hey, I, you know, call yourself a data scientist, maybe particularly, but you're definitely a technical founder of a data science company, uh, definitely a hacker. And so you probably have an interesting insight into what makes a great data scientist. So for me, what makes a really great data scientist is someone who's product-minded. Frankly, I, I think the relationship between product management and data science is often overlooked by many people. Mm -hmm. um, 
these, these machine learning techniques are born out of academic research. You know, many, many of these techniques were first theorized in the 50s and mm -hmm. have been around in principle for, for a long time. Um, and what's, what makes a data scientist, in my view, a data scientist is that this person is not in the academy performing research for research's sake, uh, but instead for applying those skills to the real world somehow. And I think, you know, we are all accustomed to these, to Netflix and Amazon's recommendations, and Spotify, and you name your flavor of uh, exciting uh, or elegant user experience. We, this is the world we have become accustomed to, and data scientists have created that world. And um, yeah, so w w when I look for in a data scientist is somebody who sees those opportunities and has a particular uh, ability to articulate uh, to normal people the value of certain types of uh, very complex work that normal people are not going to understand that they don't need to understand. Uh, and helping businesses build uh, and understand those use cases and, and build towards them. Yeah, hugely important in practice. You know, if you trained as a data scientist um, in a formal program, so an, a, a formal education program like a bachelor's degree, a master's degree in data science, um, a PhD in machine learning, um, or you self-taught on Udemy or Coursera or whatever, and you haven't been uh, exposed to commercial problems, it's, it's very easy to overlook this, which is, as you say, I mean, you brought it up as something that makes a great data scientist, and it, it could be the most important thing. It actually, in, in practice, for the most part, it doesn't matter that you know the most sophisticated approaches. It doesn't matter that you know uh, exactly how the linear algebra or the calculus works. So that can be useful in a lot of applications, and it, it can expand what you can do uh, in terms of creativity with a solution, potentially. But the most important thing is how can I deliver value as quickly as possible to this client or to this business problem in my own company? Uh, it's that delivering value, this kind of product mindedness. And I guess another part of it that you're saying there is also you know, being mindful of exactly what the user experience will be. Yeah, or, or at least encouraging the other stakeholders that are involved in building something encouraging them to understand the capabilities of your work and the limitations. And uh, you know, that's when the real magic happens, is when a product designer who doesn't understand any of the intricacies of data science work is working successfully to build and deliver those kinds of magical experiences that you know, we all love. Yeah, a good uh, contrived example that I'm sure happens all the time is you could, as a data scientist, say, okay, well, you know, you've given me this difficult natural language problem, this difficult uh, machine vision problem or something, and so you use the latest and greatest, you go to archive, you find the most fancy object detection model possible, or uh, the most elaborate natural language processing model, and it gives you like 1% better accuracy than a regression model or something. <laughs> totally. Like know, knowing when the juice is not worth the squeeze and to be able to identify the low-hanging fruit. Like data science work is very expensive. This is not cheap R&D uh, work. And being able to, to iterate quickly, get something live, prove it out. If it works, improve it later. Uh, yeah. that, that, that kind of um, attitude towards the work is also contributes to my view of what a great data science team is all about. Yeah, and that, that is all 100% spot on. Um, but where I was actually going with that is that even that choice to use the very, uh, you know, this Bleeding enormous, edge. yeah, it like, it might mean that in terms of user experience is terrible. Mm. Because maybe with the regression model that was 1% less accurate, it took a thousandth of the time or <laughs> a millionth of the time to get you the result. So as a user, you get this on-screen immediate experience Whereas if they use like the big, deep, latest cutting edge model, it's like they're waiting around 10 seconds to get the result or something. Yes. Yeah. So I love that answer. Thanks for that. So 
We talked earlier about how you transitioned from an Arabic and Spanish degree into being a, uh, a technical founder. There's one question that I have left related to that, which is how are you so successful so young? Like, do you have tips and tricks for listeners? You know, you, you came from um, a non-technical background very quickly self-taught how to hack enough to understand these problems and then just dove feet first, founded a company, was CEO of the company. After five years, you're acquired by a big listed, well-respected data company. You know, and now you're onto your second startup and you've already raised almost $50 million. So how could a listener who wants to get to that end point of uh, building successful technology companies, maybe a data science company, mm -hmm. and whether they already have data science skills or maybe they don't have technical skills at all, how can they bridge that gap over the next few years? Uh, well, I th th I'll happily accept, humbly accept <laughs> these compliments, though I don't, I don't know how deserving <laughs> I may be. Um, I, I would say that just asking lots of questions being uh, really generous with your time uh, and being willing to just be, be very honest with asking for help uh, is a big part of it. You know, in, in the early days, for me, it was a lot of generosity of those on my team, you know, spending time explaining concepts to me uh, as far as adopting new technical skills. Um, with respect to entrepreneurship, just know that you can do it. Uh, it you, you, you definitely get a job at a startup. If you're interested to start your own company, uh, work somewhere early stage. The earlier stage, the better if what your goal is, is to start a company. Um, there's no better way to, to learn how it all works than just by doing it. And a lot of people don't know that startup jobs are even available right. because they may not be listed on the jobs page, but let me give you a, a, an insider's view. Um, startups don't have the resources to send representatives to career fairs. Right. And, and uh, I respond, to it, if I get an email from somebody directly, every single time I take the meeting, I don't care what the role is, every single time. And I'm, I'm not special at all. Uh, you email. You, if you find a company that you're interested to work for, email the, the top person in whatever the, the field is. You want to work in engineering, email the CTO. Um, that's my advice, and I, I think that you, are, you will have very high response rates. Yeah, because probably. startups need people that are really ambitious and really hungry and curious, and you know, we don't have endless uh, room to hire an infinity, uh, infinitely large um, team. We only really have room for people who are very, very excited to, to be there. Yeah, I suspect a, a part of, uh, of having that uh, cold reach out be successful, I agree with you 100%, um, that it can be a successful approach, but a, a probably a key that was uh, implicit in what you're saying, but maybe uh, we could make explicit, is that your email needs to be tailored to the company that you're emailing. Yeah, to... I mean, definitely, uh, you, you can't just lob a generic email over the wall. But if, if what you're interested in is, you know, working for a particular startup, just email directly and tell them. Yeah. Cool. Awesome tips. Ask lots of questions. Be generous with your time. Be honest about asking for help, about needing help. And um, know that you can do it and work at an early stage startup. Those are great practical tips that anyone can execute on. All right, Austin, every episode, I ask for a book recommendation. Do you have one for us? Hmm. Uh, I, I always love, I would probably read it once a year, Eastern Approaches by Fitzroy MacLean. One of the, it's a memoir. Uh, it's one of the, the people who Ian Fleming based James Bond's character after. Oh, no kidding. Very interesting. Adventure, a lot of adventure. There's a real person that James Bond is based off of. Yeah. yeah. No way. Yeah, Fitzroy McLean. Wow. Yeah, Eastern Approaches. Cool, there you go. Love it. All right, and then clearly you are a fount of valuable knowledge on data science, on tech startups. How can people follow you? How can listeners 
keep up with what you're doing? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Nice. Twitter, Austin Ogilvy. Same right. on LinkedIn. Yeah, we'll be sure to have those links in the show notes. All right, Austin. Thank you so much for being on the program. It's been wonderful. And hopefully we can catch up with you again sometime in the future. Thank you. Appreciate being here. Well, I really appreciate Austin making the journey over the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan to film this episode with me in person. It made for a strong personal connection while filming that I hope was tangible to you while listening to the recording. In the episode, Austin described his journey into and successfully out of his famed Y Hat data science startup, including practical tips like how switching from a consumer focus to an enterprise focus could potentially enable you to 10x the price of your software, dramatically increasing revenue. He also talked about how the prestigious Y Combinator program accelerates startups' capacity to find product market fit and network effects, as well as to collaborate with other ambitious startups. He talked about how structuring your compliance efforts, such as with the tools provided by his firm Leica, is the growth lever, enabling companies to expedite and increase the success rate of software deals. And he provided his tips for being a successful technical founder, whether you come from a formal technical background or not. Namely, be generous with your time. Be honest about needing help and ask for it. Know that you can do it and work at an early stage tech startup to gain exposure. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Austin's LinkedIn and Twitter profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at www.superdatascience.com 535. That's superdatascience.com 535. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. This episode is particularly interesting because I am in person with a guest, which has only happened for the second time. Uh, so you might want to check that YouTube recording out. Um, and yeah, I encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. All right. Thanks to Ivana, Mario, Jaime, JP, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another inspiring episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.